Hi, everyone. So, are we ready? Yes. Okay, more or less, we're ready. It's a full house here today? Okay. So, first of all, thank you so much for coming. Good morning. Hello, Chef Liang, Chef Rudolph, Chef Wan, Chef Darren, KY. Thank you so much for coming again, my esteemed judges. Uh, I'm just going to start with a small introduction about myself first. All right. So, my name is Nuril Karim. All right. You can call me Nuril. My friends in Penang call me Mamu. Mamu means Tamil. Hey, in Tamil, it means uncle. Maybe because they think I look like a nasi kanda seller. But actually, I'm a trained chef. To be, if you know, I'm a trained chef. And I was born in Penang. I grew up there. And after I finished my school, I went to KL to continue my studies. First of all, I continued my studies in pre-law. Clearly, that didn't work out very well because I'm here right now. And it took a lot of convincing to my parents that I wanted to really follow my passion and really become a chef. Since I was young, I was always mucking about the kitchen, you know, disturbing my mom, disturbing my maid, because I always saw the kitchen as a place of activity. And I always knew that this is something I could do every day. So I left law school and joined culinary school. I finished my diploma. I did my degree in events management. I came back to Penang to train in the ENO hotel. I know Chef Wan has stayed there for a few days. Uh, and after that, I went back to KL to work in a French restaurant, Cilantro and my chef was Japanese. So over my career, I've learned a lot of things of how we kind of fuse things together and how we can marry uh, ingredients and techniques from completely different sources and how we can make it something very unique. So a little bit about myself. And after I finished my stint in cilantro, my family decided to open a business in Penang. Now my parents being academics, they had no idea how to run a business. So I kind of saw it myself you know, coming back to Penang, so I had to resign from my restaurant. And so far, everything has been running good. We say Alhamdulillah. Uh, the restaurant has been successful for about three years already now. And here I am today. So in Penang, what we promote is Peranakan cuisine, Jawi Peranakan. Chef Wan would be very familiar with what Peranakan is. So some of you who don't know what Peranakan is, it's basically an a offspring where the parents are a hybrid. So you have a local mother and a straight settler, usually a father. And more often than not, in places like Malacca, Singapore, the Peranakan community consists of straight Chinese. And then when they marry local Malay people, uh, they develop a small little community and culture of their own, the way they dress, the way they talk. And this as well reflects a lot in their food and the way they eat. So the Peranakans actually have been fusing things for hundreds of years, two hundreds of years. And now, in modern cuisine, we're talking about fusion. I actually don't really like to use that word, fusion. So, but the Peranakans and the mixed heritage people of Malaysia or in this region, we have been fusing ingredients for generations already. And it's about time maybe that local or our trained professional chefs learn a little bit from these people and how we can marry these flavors together. So right here today, I'm going to just brief you about what I'm going to cook. It's a local dish. It's my interpretation of how we can harvest, harness the best of local produce. Uh, it's a red snapper. And on the red snapper, we have a prawn otak otak muslin. It's served with a ulam pesto and on the side with pucuk paku or fiddle fern warm salad of sorts. So it is presented in a more like a modern setting, but the flavors and the characteristics of the dish are very much Southeast Asian. So this is actually my true passion. Apart from running my business in Jawi Peranakan culture, I love to promote local produce. As a chef, I have traveled in a few places. I just came back from England two months ago. And over there, you know, they, really, they really sell the farmer's markets, the local produce, and people really enjoy going and, and feeling so proud about what their, uh, their county can produce. And I think it's similar over here. Malaysia has such fantastic ingredients beautiful local produce, uh, beautiful seafood, meat and vegetables. And I think, why should we import so many vegetables and so kasihan the vegetables, put them on a flight and they travel 12 hours over here to Malaysia in an ice box and you unpack it. And more often than not, the chefs over here, they don't exactly know what to do. So why not we just try to put these local produce on the next level, put it on a stage where it can really shine and not be in like a typical machi machi nasi campur joint. 
Okay? So first things first, I have my plate. Alright? So the components of the dish are quite interesting. Some of you who are local definitely definitely you will be quite familiar with all of this. One minute. Alright. So over here. First things first, I want to explain to you about the pesto which I've made. So this is going to be served with the fish. Now you can see, it is a very vibrant, bright, nice colour. Or the French call it pistou as well. And how I've actually achieved this is you're going to do it at home. Obviously when you're cooking pesto with pasta, you will have a big pesto mortar, usually with a very beautiful Italian lady next to you, pounding away with, a, with pine nuts and basil and sometimes some mint and olive oil. So it's basically the same thing here, but I've replaced a lot of the basil with local ulam or local greens or what we eat raw. For example, kado, selom, and lemon basil, kemangi. And I've grinded it, I've replaced the pine nuts with cashew nuts. You can use almonds or any sort of fatty nut as well, but I think cashew nuts are beautiful, high fat content, and they're local as well. They're produced in Southeast Asia and they have a wonderful flavor. All right, so this is the pesto. And how I wanted to explain the trick to maintain its bright colour, it's been prepared about 20 minutes ago and still, right now, it's still very, very bright. I actually blanched it first. So, gather all of the ingredients together, your garlic, your leaves and everything. You blanch it for about, I did it for 8 seconds. I shocked it in ice water, I dabbed it a little bit and when I grind it, I added a bit of parmesan cheese, olive, uh, palm oil, good quality palm oil and the cashew nuts. Alright, so here we go. This is the plate. I'm just going to put a little bit here. I'm just going to pull it. All right. So this is the pesto. And over here, I want to show you our fiddle fern. Now, this is a really, really nice vegetable. You can see it's called the fiddle fern. It's because the tips of it curl up and it looks like a fiddle or a violin. And this is actually forage wild in Malaysia. People don't produce it, people don't cultivate it. In the markets, you have young men going into the jungle looking for it. And it's a very common Malay vegetable, usually cooked in coconut milk, stewed for a long time. And it's usually been sitting in the ban marie for about 12 hours before people put it in their mixed rice. But here, we've just blanched it very quickly and shocked it. And it still maintains its really, really bright colour. So I'm going to make a very simple warm salad with some shallot rings, okay. There's a finely chopped lemongrass, some julienne red chilli, all right, and maybe a few leaves of coriander. All right, I have made also a simple dressing. This consists of nice good quality palm oil, a bit of lime juice, a little bit of fish sauce, sugar and salt. So it should have a very strong acidity, all right? And it should be well balanced with the sugar as well. So I'm just going to spoon a little bit just to give the salad a little bit of a sheen. And this is a beautiful vegetable. Like I said, in Malaysia, we got some beautiful ingredients like this. Why would you want to import like fennel? or so many other broccolini when you have beautiful, local, fresh ingredients such as this. So you look at that, it's sitting really nicely, get some of the stuff at the bottom. And just for your own information, this fiddle fern is actually packed with iron, it's very high in protein. So the rural people of Malaysia, the, the Malays who live in the kampong, this is actually a good source of protein. So when they don't have enough meat of, or chicken or fish, this is substituted to, for nutrition. So with the high in iron, high in vitamin A and B, it does oxidize quite quickly after you blanch it. So you've got to blanch it. I blanch it with heavily salted water and a little bit, one or two tablespoons of oil in the water and you get this really nice sheen after it's done. And it reduces the possibility of oxidize, oxidization again. The similar thing about what we did with the pesto. All right, so that's really, really cool. And, last but not least, our fish is ready in my oven over here. Ding! It's done. <laughs> the oven's not on, but yeah, okay. So we have fish, it's covered, it's still warm. 
All right, so this is a beautiful piece of local snapper. I fillet the snapper by myself, all right, and I've removed the skin and I've made this fast, this force meat with prawn. I've grinded some of these local ingredients. Okay, I think it's not here. The local ingredients consist of shallots, lemongrass, galangal, chili, garlic, ginger. I grind it into a sambal. I fry that with some shrimp paste. I cool it down and I blend it with the prawn. I add coconut milk, I add an egg, I add some lime juice, I add a bit of salt. So this is all is going to be really, really well balanced and it's just going to burst. Malaysia, burst, Southeast Asia, oh my god, what's going on here? But it's, it's really nice. So I've covered it with some banana leaf, I've oiled the pan and I've oiled the top of it. And you can see over here. The banana leaf as well, if you oil it nicely, it's almost like a natural, natural non-stick. So I'm just going to take it really gently. I'm going to put it over here. All right. So how we get this bright, nice color is from the, fresh, uh, the freshly ground dried chili paste, the red palm oil, and the fresh ingredients. Like there's a bit of turmeric as well. Very quickly, I have made, actually, last minute since I had time, made some chili oil with the remainder uh, oil which split from the sambal just to moisten the fish a little bit. All right. And with ota ota, a very, very common thing with ota ota is going to be daun kado. So daun kado is another variety of a very local plant. It's from the piper species, but it's much more herbal. In fact, Sangway College grows it everywhere around the guard house. It's because you know, uh, landscape artists actually use it for a, a crop coverer, and it's a very good crop coverer. But if you steam it, like usual otak otak, it's a very pungent herbal taste, which some people like it. Some nations love it, some nations don't. So what I did, I chiffonade, which is finely sliced it. I roll the leaves in like a cigar and I flash fry it. So when you flash fry it, it gives this very nice, beautiful green color. All right. What Ahong, one of my participants, he calls the green afro. Okay. But it has the same consistency or the taste as if you were to fry nori. So working from cilantro or anything, we do garnish with, we have about eight to 10 varieties of seaweed. And this is just one little thing which is going to be very, very nice. And just to finish it off over here very quickly, another very Southeast Asian ingredient. This is uh, kantan or the ginger torch. All right, it's beautiful, it's pink, it's fresh, it's gingery. But again, some Europeans and some Westerners might not enjoy the taste. So what I've done to just reduce it so it can balance very nicely with the rest of the food is I've done a quick pickle. All right, you put this boil some water, add some sugar and salt, and I've used rice vinegar. So it's a very, very simple way. So this is just a little bit of this kantan pickle, which I'm going to scatter everywhere. And it's beautiful. It's pink, and it's completely natural. There, have, there has been no coloring added to it. And this is it. So everything here has some sort of health benefits. Like I said, the pucho paku, it has full of iron, it's full of vitamins. It can make you look young if you eat enough of it. It's very crunchy, it's very fresh, and it has this nice earthy taste. You know, if you look at old depictions of dinosaurs, you see dinosaurs eating ferns and everything like that. So dinosaurs eat pucho paku. Dinosaurs grow big eating this. And why? Why not we eat this, right? If your children or your kids say, ah, oh, you know, I don't eat vegetables, I don't like anything green. You say, you know, Awang, if you want to be big and strong like a dinosaur, you better eat pucuk paku, okay? So <laughs> this, is how, this is how we try to train, train our kids. I've loved eating vegetables since I was young. I don't know what's wrong with some of the kids nowadays. But just to finish it off, just for the crunch, I have had some of the cashews which I reserve from the pesto, a little scatter here. A little bit messy, but that's the way I am. You see my hair, I'm also a little bit messy. Okay, but this is it. So I've tried to introduce the best of local produce. We got the kado, locally caught fish, locally caught or farmed prawns. It's mixed with sambal, foraged vegetables, foraged ulam to make a pesto, 
uh, even the kantan is not grown, you get some people going into the jungle, and that's why when there's a lot of haze, these things don't bloom out very nicely. So thank God for the past four days, the weather has been beautiful, and in the market, Le Coran Bleu has been so fantastic to produce such wonderful ingredients for me today. So I hope everybody has enjoyed my short demo. I'm sure some of you are curious at how it's going to taste, but it'll taste really, really good, and it's going to really, you're going to realize how, how much you can do with our local produce. And whatever imported produce which I've used, like the Parmesan cheese and whatnot, is just to lift, to lift the original produce to a different level. So over here, last but not least, I've just used a microplane and grated some Parmesan very quickly. In the restaurant, we do it with a microwave, but here, and we have a very strong oven, so it's Parmesan crisp. You can just crack it up. Okay, it's very nice. And we can stick it, stick it. <laughs> we can just put it or scatter it. How long have you had your restaurant in there? Uh, it's been, we have entered our third year. So we've been running for two years. The seating, we, we can seat 55 downstairs. It's been divided into two sections. It's like an old heritage house. So there's an airwell in the middle. So it's like 25 in front, 25 at the back. And there's an art gallery upstairs. I'm running full time. I have a team of about six, seven people. I've trained them quite thoroughly. They should be able to, to produce what I tell them. Business is pretty good. Business is pretty good. It is a, a family thing. My mother, after retiring, she compiled many of her family, my grandmother's recipes, and published this book called The Feast of Penang. And after it's published, people were like, you know, where can I taste this? Where can I taste that? I'll cook this. You, you know, you write already, but okay. You come to our shop and you can taste it. So we promote Jawi Peranakan cuisine. Jawi Peranakan. So it's the same as Peranakan, Nyonya Peranakan, but the word Jawi just means Muslim Peranakan. So the settlers are from Muslim straight settlers from the Middle East, from Pakistan, from India, and have married local Malay people and produced people like myself. I speak Malay at home. Okay, so in our restaurant, a very traditional dish of Penang would be like something nasi lemuni, uh, balmia. So nasi lemuni is similar to a herbal rice cooked with coconut milk, like you would say, or in Pahang they call it nasi lemak lemuni. But it's used with this daun lemuni, which is traditionally in Ayurvedic medicine, and it's meant for anti-aging. So you go to the kampung, daun lemuni is called daun awet muda. So if you want your hair to be black and you look young again, you have to eat nasi lemuni every day. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. All right, this is it. I don't serve this in a restaurant, unfortunately. Uh, our restaurant is quite constrained to its theme, which is more homely, traditional. But this is what I've been training in college and when I was working. So it's what I really like to do. Not too authentic, not too traditional. A bit more, more modern in how it's presented. The flavor should be quite familiar if you're from Asia. Mm. See this is a true representation of yourself? I would say it's a true representation of the things which I thoroughly enjoy. So it, I, I really enjoy local Southeast Asian food and I make it a point to travel within Southeast Asia before I go further to Europe and things like that. So I've gone to Thailand, Vietnam, Philippines, and I think we share a lot of similarities uh, between one another. But Malaysia, because of you know our mixed traditions and everything, we have so much more to offer. And I think currently in Malaysia, it's lacking in that sense, that how we are promoting our local produce. Yeah, it's, not, it's not how other countries are doing it. Very nicely. What, what, like this. Oh, sorry. what dish would you say this was uh, inspired from? Uh, uh, definitely, initially it was inspired, to be honest, when I was studying uh, Manco Pia White, when he was just started his career. I think, was it Manco? Yeah, I think it was Manco. He created like a dish with a halibut fillet, and it was encased with uh, shrimp and pork pass, and it was wrapped in savoy cabbage and steamed. So I have always, since watching that video, I've tried it out many times. I've done mushroom fast, uh, chicken, and whatnot. 
And I think when you have locally caught fish, which is not too fatty, mm. like compared to European fish, it's very fatty. Uh, it's nice to add more luxurious <laughs> taste to it with the otak otak. Slightly more lemma. Slightly more lemma. Yeah. More, you get the more savory seafood taste. Yeah. yeah. I like the taste, but I wish you have a bit more sauce instead of this green thing. I would have prefer more sauce with it. More like yeah, more like you know more more lemak sauce thing. You know, come on. Okay. Other than the green. The best. Mm. Yeah. I think your philosophy to take care about healthiness is very uh, very interesting. Yes. yes. Because you know, while you the vegetables, you go to looking to. As you say, maybe to, uh, in, in jungle to find yes. some special herbs or vegetables. It's, it's, it's very... Uh, it's different. It's like uh, it's, uh, in Europe, it's in the seasons, yeah. you yeah. worry for mushrooms, yeah. mm. you mm. for other things. Huh? Right. Yeah. Okay. After the rain, you get a lot of these birds popping up. But cool. it's good. Yeah. Mm. It is. Nice dishes. Yes. I'm going to assume that this is presented as a main dish. This is going to yes. be a main dish. Yes, so uh, I, I would usually add a small starch to it. Yes. Like So I think knowing that you are missing a starch, the yeah. question would therefore be, why was it not included in the plate? Uh, I think as a total dish, yeah. just with the flavours, I thought it would be more than enough to represent what I like. So I thought a starch would be a bit too heavy, because I find the dish with the palm oil elements, the palm oil in the a bit too much, you yeah, think? I was aiming it to be like a nice uh, entree, it's not really a main course. Okay. Well, as flavors go, I quite like what it is. Mm. I've got a robust pisto, pistou, pistou, the way you said it. <laughs> Flaky crust, I like it. Um, okay, I'm going to go with the presentation style. Um, I, feel, I felt it was maybe a little bit too stiff up front. Like you were just kind of waiting to get into your element and then you gradually warmed up towards just the now. end. Yeah, just oh, now. Okay. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the ending was like a long goodbye that was waiting to just, you know, that was just waiting to happen. It was, okay, is he ended? Is he going to end? Will it ever end? Kind of a, kind of a vibe that we got going on. Um, nice little historical lead up. You gave a little bit of a history lesson as to what we entered the dish and the different ingredients that you sourced. Fluency in your plating was really good. Uh, you demonstrated your knowledge of the different ingredients that you used and we liked that because it was a... Uh, just a nice dose, not too much. Not too. Yeah, so I like that. Coupled with a good dish, well, yeah, you're on a good roll. So, so yeah. Sorry about the dragging on. <laughs> I think I got more than, you know, I got more than what I was bargaining for. All was right. I was excited. And I was like, okay, there's so many things I can talk about. First, I thought 15 minutes was going to be too long. Yes. But it's well, good that you're comfortable. Mm. It's very important. But I wish I could see you work more. Lah. But I'm sure that one you can put in. But, but obviously you're very comfortable on, on, on camera and doing stuff, so that's good. That's a big plus. Because yeah, yeah. the most important thing that when you go on television is like, you know, you have to be very comfortable uh, you know, at ease at what you do. And then, of course, knowing all your stuff and then delivering. But of course, you have only a certain precise time. You know, you yeah. can't go blabbing away on and on and on. Because uh, that gets edited off anyway, you know. Uh, but other than that, you don't have to worry because that's the director's job anyway. But other than that, it's uh, you know, for you to have fun and, and it's good. You know, the way you, you project yourself, I like you know, that, that you really you know, speak out you know, about you know, all your, your, your past, your history and then of course your opinion about you know, uh, the food and, 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 and of course you know, the style of yeah. or doing things on that. So that's great. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think in the future, if you do happen to have your own series and work, you know, this is what you want to do. Mm. Get back, don't, don't try to diversify, not just specialise in your need, but yes. try to learn different things on that. Yeah. Then, um, I think, you know, uh, it's, you have a good future, you know, mm. to go on TV, yeah, and inshallah. That's what I projected the other day. Mm. I know it's the finals and everybody's so stressed out, mm. so I just wanted to come up and show everybody that I love to mm. go and I'm mm. just having fun. Regardless in the kitchen or mm. on the stage. Because like, we, we, can't, we can't test you just, being on TV, we just you know this recipe, of course, yeah. because you're gonna have this huge repertoire, you know, right. to go. But I think the I think the most important thing is to see you, you know, behind camera and handling that and and having the confidence. That is so important because the minute you know you go on silent or you know what to do, da da da, it's like that's it, you know. Because you have to understand, people that watch cooking shows are not people who like uh, to cook all the time. They like to be entertained as well. So yeah. you you have that kind of sense of humor. 
uh, and and that's so important to have a bit because you learn you learn the trick and all that uh, and then especially when you have all live studio audience you go in because you're going to also present a lot in in live shows and all that no? not yeah. just on television you're going to cooking demonstrations so you did i you did very well with the i i think you know yeah, yeah.